Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar of our new webinar series. Today's webinar is Making the Grade, a look inside the algorithm evaluation process at Quantopian. The presenter is Dr. Jess Stout. She is Quantopian's managing director on the investment team. Quantopian is a crowdsourced quantitative investment firm that inspires talented people from around the world to write investment algorithms. Jess and her team are in charge of selecting the algorithms from the Quantopian community for our portfolio. Quantopian offers license agreements for algorithms that fit our investment strategy, and the licensing authors are paid based on their strategy's individual performance. Previously, Jess worked as an equity quant analyst at the Starmine Corporation and as a director of quant product strategy for Thomson Reuters prior to joining Quantopian. So now let me hand it off to Jess to present today's webinar. Okay, thanks, Phoebe. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. It looks like we've got a lot of folks um, on the line, um, including uh, some familiar names to me. So uh, welcome, and thanks a lot for, for joining. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our algo selection process. Um, as Phoebe said, my role at Quantopian um, is principally focused on evaluating algorithms that folks build on the platform and selecting ones that are uh, that are sort of quote unquote the best, but but for us that means the best fit for our investment mandate. Um, those algos we select um, for allocations, and you know you the creator um, retain a copy, retain your your license to your IP, and you get paid based on performance. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, during the course of the talk, feel free to um, type questions in. Um, I'm not going to be reading them while I'm going through the presentation, but I expect to be able to cover the slides um, with plenty of time left over to go through the Q&A. So feel free to log your questions um, in real time. And I think Phoebe will interrupt me if um, you guys let me know that you, know, you suddenly can't hear or see uh, what I'm talking about. All right. Um, so let's, let's get started and see how I advance the slides. There we go. All right. So uh, disclaimer, I'm not giving investment advice here. Um, so let me take a, a quick step back again. Um, uh, presumably, a lot of you are pro probably familiar, familiar with Quantopian, um, but taking a little step back to how we think about the organization of where this um, algorithm selection topic that I'm going to talk about today fits in to our broader company and, and sort of um, platform. So we think of uh, the community and our platform plus data as combining to make you know, an extremely powerful uh, sort of external and crowdsourced research department. The output of that research department, the work product, comes and filters into our investment pro process. So that investment process has sort of four major components, um, selecting algorithms that are gonna be included in our invested portfolio, actually constructing that portfolio. I'm not gonna talk a lot about that today, but it's a really interesting area. Um, it's basically where we go from, you know, a set of N algorithms to a set of um, weights per algorithm. And it turns out to be a really important part of the process. Um, there's a risk management component, and that's that sort of part and parcel, actually, of how we think about constructing the portfolio. Um, and then finally, trading and execution, turning this cohort of algorithms and weights into actual you know, trades that get executed out there in the real market. The output of the entirety of that investment process is combined into an investment vehicle. Um, and that investment vehicle's returns are um, you know, how we pay authors their license royalties. So like I said, today I'm going to talk about algorithm select, the algorithm selection component of that process. Um, so there are sort of three key components to how we select algorithms for allocations. Um, the first is really just kind of uh, structural. So every time um, that a backtest is run or an algorithm is launched into live trading, that piece of code is uh, version controlled and timestamped in Quantopian's database. Um, that means that we can, um, you know, basically extract a set of features that span performance, risk, structure, um, and an and theory author behavior, and we can um, create this version controlled and timestamped database of ideas. Um, we rely a lot on that um, timestamp as sort of the algorithm's birthday, if you will. Um, and that knowledge feeds into the second key step, which is the reliance on true out-of-sample data. So I think one of the main 
um, and most vexing challenges in quant finance is that really your stated goal is to build a model that describes data, um, but mo the model that perfectly describes the data you have in hand will almost certainly not be the best model that describes future data that you receive, right? So this sort of classic overfitting problem. And since Quantopian is evaluating these algorithms at you know, arm's length, where we're not uh, writing the algorithms ourselves, we're not investigating, we're reading the source code. Instead, um, we basically are uh, evaluating the algorithms on the basis of their data exhaust. What we felt was the most conservative approach was to really label data as out of sample, only if it's data that's accumulated, effectively time that's passed since the code has been written. So what we're doing in our model validation process is we're basically grabbing you know, every algorithm that was written, let's say, six months ago um, or more. We're running it through an internal back test where we have um, apples to apples comparison, start dates, end dates, capital base, cost model that we set across all algorithms. Um, and then we're able to compare in sample performance to the subsequent six months of out of sample performance. Um, algorithms that pass all of our automated filtering and screening criteria are then typically reviewed by hand by a member of the investment team um, to sort of make sure that they you know, really fit the, um, the investment mandate and, and look good to us. Um, and at that point, we pass into sort of the third component, which is an in-person um, author diligence. So um, the slides I'm going to run through today sort of show you a, a little bit of a look inside that manual um, review that our investment team would do on an algorithm that has, um, you know, hopefully passed, let's say, some or all of those um, upstream criteria. So the last component, the author diligence component, contains a lot of steps, as you might imagine. So once an algorithm um, looks good on paper, then we want to dig a little bit deeper. So we reach out to the author, um, you know, usually through sort of a form email where you know uh, we take the view that maybe they do or don't know how our business model works. So we explain to them, you know, why we're interested in, in speaking with them and sort of what the opportunity looks like. Um, we do usually a Skype interview, um, video or phone interview, talk to them, explain, you know, again how the model works and and what we're why we're interested in their work and specifically which algorithm we're interested in. Um, once they understand what the story is, then um, we send them sort of a mini due diligence questionnaire where they're going to explain to us uh, sort of their view of what the economic rationale is, why the strategy works, um, not designed to sort of reveal their you know secret sauce, but rather to sort of explain the style. Um, that's really useful to us because we can cross validate the author's description of why the strategy works with what the data exhaust looks like. Um, and that's often a helpful process for both us and the author. Um, to sort of meet in the middle and be on the same page. Um, we also run a background check in the local jurisdiction of the author, um, and we explain and share an, the IP license agreement that shows sort of all the nitty gritty terms of how the author is going to get paid per, for performance. Um, then the last step is um, there's sort of a gauntlet of operational and performance checks that the algo runs through um, to make sure it's production ready. Um, one of the really nice things about the way our infrastructure is built is that there's not a need to effectively rewrite or recode strategies to go from a research environment to a production environment. So um, with those operational and performance checks, we're really trying to actually minimize um, any touching of the code that would need to be done. Um, but things like, you know, deprecated APIs or something that, that had been used um, or, you know, uh, tweaks to the uh, tradable universe, something like that. Those are the things we're looking to catch at that step. Um, so that's a gauntlet. At the end of all of that, all of those diligence steps being checked off, um, internally, we put together um, a, in, a package of information. So it contains all this stuff. And we have a formal meeting, uh, I think typically monthly, where our CIO um, would formally review and sign off on algorithms to be included in the portfolio. All right. So uh, so that's the high level. Um, so let's get to the sort of fun part. Um, so you think you have a great algorithm. We're going to dive in and look at some algorithms that uh, we've evaluated and sort of show you, um, you know, where they where they fell short and didn't make it all the way. So you can uh, sort of think about those um, criteria yourself. OK, so here's an example algo um, that um, 
here's an example uh, tear sheet analysis, sort of subset of the tear sheet analysis that we're going to look at. Um, so all of these algos have uh, been given sort of new code names. Um, this one we're going to refer to as the Illinois spider. So there's a, there's a lot of information, summary information packed into this view, um, but let me step you through it a little bit so you sort of um, see where we're going with this. Um, so on the left side, we've got uh, sort of a sample table with a lot of summary statistics about the algorithm, and you'll see that the uh, performance stats are broken out into um, sort of two subsets of time period, and you can see in the plot those two time periods are delineated with uh, green and red in the equity curve. So we're looking here at a back test that starts in 2010 and runs through, um, looks like early 2000 or February 27th of 2017. And the prior, the last six months of this time period are what we're calling true out of sample. So that means that this author um, wrote this code basically six months prior to February of 2017. Um, so this algorithm looks, you know, if anything, sort of too good to be true in the time period leading up to going out of sample. And then uh, if you sort of zoom in, the time period since going out of sample um, does not live up to the expectations that were set by the in-sample period. Um, and so this is, you know, uh, unfortunately a very common um, problem. Um, so you can sort of see in sample sharp ratio, we form an expectation is going to be four and out of sample sharp ratio. Now, granted, it's a much smaller time range, so the data is a little bit noisy. Um, out of sample sharp ratio is, you know, one tenth of that or 0.4. And so that's, um, you know, now probably not going to pass um, selection to go to the next step. Um, so the takeaway from that, this first example, and this is probably you know, sort of the most common problem that we see, that's uh, why, why I put this one first, is that out of sample results not matching up with in sample results raise a concern of overfitting. And one academic result that we think about um, and sort of base some of our analyses on um, is that if you can observe six months of out of sample daily returns with a observed sharp ratio of one or better, you've got about a 75% probability of seeing a positive sharp ratio in the future. And there's a, an academic reference that I've listed here um, that's sort of a nice jumping off point to, um, to look at. It. All right, so let's go into our second example, which is the Vermont trout. Um, so we can sort of see right away uh, the Vermont trout doesn't have, you know, at least as bad of a problem um, with sort of apparent or possible overfitting. So he's got an in-sample sharp ratio of 1.8. Um, and in the subsequent six months, he's achieved an out-of-sample sharp ratio of one. That's really good. Um, you can see that, you know, while maybe his return sort of dipped on the lower edge of this sort of cone of expectation um, in the first half of the out of sample period, he's sort of staying within the cone of expectation at this point. Um, so this looks like it's potentially in line um, and would sort of pass that threshold. So where we come to the problem, um, at least for our investment mandate with this strategy, is once we look at um, the... Um, uh, realized beta or correlation with the broad market index, the SPY, um, and we look at the dollar exposure. So I've kind of highlighted these two plots that are part of our um, Pifolio tear sheet analysis here. So you can see that on a trailing rolling basis, you get as high as a 0.5 measured um, correlation with the market, and the algorithm is overall dollar long. So why is this a problem for us? And I get this question a lot, which is, you know, hey, look, maybe I've got um, a net long exposure or a net beta exposure, but the strategy makes money. So why why is this not something that you're interested in? And really, this comes down to um, the fact that we're forming a portfolio of algorithms that we're creating as one investment product, but we're paying each author on their performance alone. And so what that means is um, that we really require each individual algorithm to have pretty tight risk controls on its own because that author is getting paid on their results on their own. And there's really not a great way um, to pay or, or sort of charge them an insurance fee from some other hedging algorithm that might exist. So in the absence of creating some sort of other exogenous hedge to the individual algos, what we find is that common factor risk, dollar, market, sector exposure, they do not um, just naturally diversify away as you build a larger portfolio of algorithms. 
Um, and then another question I get asked a lot is, okay, well, sure, my strategy um, has you know a long bias or a beta exposure, um, but what about if I just correct it after the fact and hedge? So you know, sort of explained in the first bullet point, the problem with kind of like an exogenous hedging that, hedging that Quantopian would control. And it turns out that it's also the case that if you sort of try to um, adjust after the fact for this common factor risk exposure, you're adding hedging, that's, you know, insurance, it comes at a cost. So it's going to degrade the expected performance of the strategy. So we've tried that um, in, in some cases, and sometimes it can work, but often it actually results in um, the performance, you know, then with of the strategy plus making it hedge now doesn't pass um, sort of the um, criteria. So really, we're looking for algorithms that have low common factor risk exposures by design and derive most of their returns from stock selection. Um, so here, I'll sort of like forward sell, I guess, a little bit and give you guys the heads up that you know we understand that we um, haven't given. Um, I don't think the community sort of the full suite of tools you would need to make it really, really easy to understand what your common risk factor exposures are and, and be able to control them. Um, but that's changing and we're working a lot on that internally. So on the research team, we have built a risk model over the past couple of months. And that's something that we're going to look to be able to incorporate and let um, folks in the community be able to access the results at least of that. So you'll really be able to look um, and have an even tighter handle on you know, what common risk factor exposures is your strategy taking um, so that you can sort of think about, you know, either correcting for that or kind of going back to your hypothesis and thinking about, you know, is this really sort of a pure stock selection idea? All right, great. So here's the third example, the Michigan hippopotamus. So let's take a look at this guy. So, you know, now we know to sort of first look at the alignment of the in and out of sample performance. So um, this algo has a sharp of 1.3 in sample and actually exceeds that out of sample. Um, so, okay, uh, that looks pretty good, uh, plausibly in line. You know, it does look like there's a pretty big um, spike up, so that could be of interest. Um, you know, big discontinuities in, in the equity curve are always interesting to look at, you know, regardless of sort of whether they're to the upside or the downside. Uh, so let's dig into that sort of second tier of analysis that uh, that I have that I showed you last time. So here we see sort of one similar problem to what we had uh, with the last algo, and then one new problem. So the similar problem is we still have you know a, a pretty high and kind of drifting around trailing beta to the market. Um, so we're taking on a beta exposure of anywhere between you know, 25 and, and 50%, let's say. And then the other problem um, for me when I see this here is that now here, let's take a look in the upper right hand uh, sort of two plots here. Um, and we're looking here at the dollar exposure and then at the maximum and median single position concentration exposure in the plot right below that. And so this sort of really um, jittery dotted black line here is the net exposure um, flipping between near zero about half the time, but up to about 80% half the time. And what's driving that, you can see when you look at this individual position concentration plot, is that there's you know potentially one or probably several really concentrated positions that are basically being kind of flipped off and on. So let's say this, this dark blue line is your maximum position at any given time, and sometimes you're 50% exposed to that one position, and sometimes you drop down to being you know, let's say 5% exposed to that one position. Um, so, uh, and, and I guess lastly, I didn't sort of call this out, but you can look over here on the lower left side and you can actually see um, the rolling single factor betas to these FAMA French um, style factors. So size, growth, and momentum. And you can see that these aren't particularly well constrained either. They're sort of uh, drifting and, and sometimes, you know, drifting as much as, you know, positive one or, or, or sorry, negative one or positive 0.5. So to me, um, this makes me think that this could possibly be sort of the blend of two approaches put into one strategy. Um, now, algorithms that sort of combine more than one style. So in this case, you know, let's say from from analysis that I sort of partly showed you and partly um, partly didn't make it in the slide, I can tell that this is a combination of a long and short book that's being invested at sort of um, static position sizes, and then a single timed long only position. So an example like this is difficult to evaluate 
from the outside without having more context. So if I wanted to proceed um, and uh, sort of put this algorithm through the rest of the diligence steps, I would probably need to ask the author to separate the components out so that it's possible to evaluate each one on a standalone basis. So it's not inherently, you know, a bad idea. And of course, if you, you know, are a professional quant or talk to professional quants, um, they do think about the world a lot in terms of creating different subcomponents of their strategy and marrying them together. But this is sort of more to say that it's challenging for us, um, again, as this arm's length evaluator of a strategy, it's sometimes challenging to evaluate um, a strategy like that, that has a lot of different complexity and components. Uh, because really, what you'd like to know is that um, they, they all are contributing positively to, um, you know, the alpha or the sharp ratio, the performance of the strategy, and that can be tough um, to tell from the outside. Okay, so I think this is the last example um, strategy that I have to go through, and it's sort of the most promising looking and makes it um, the furthest along. And I think of these four that I've shared, this is the strategy that uh, made it all the way into diligence. And we you know, spoke with, with the author um, and actually had the author do um, at least one um, adjustment and revision to sort of try to see if we could make it work. So let's take, take a look at this guy. Um, so this is the Georgia pigeon. Um, so we take a look and, and you know, we're, we're happy with the consistency of, let's say, you know, the sharp ratio from the in and out of sample. So six months of, you know, really consistent returns falling, you know, right within the middle of our cone of expectation. So that looks great. <clears throat> now we look at that next level down of analysis, um, and we're happy to see that the rolling uh, factor risk, the rolling sharp ratio, um, I you know, brought in some other plots here to show some other things that we liked. The drawdowns, um, you know, are limited in, in, their, in their depth and in their length, uh, which is really nice to see. Um, and then looking at the calendarized returns, this looks good. So I really like um, these calendarized returns plots. This one uh, that's sort of the heat map shows you monthly returns by year and by month. Um, and then you can see annual returns by year. So, you know, really a nice thing you're looking for there is, you know, sort of consistency of performance. So, you know, this strategy looks um, really good. In fact, you know, depending on, um, you know, whether I didn't sort of highlight and, and, and drill into whether the strategy was applying leverage or not in the first step, but let's say that, that it, even if it is applying a bit of leverage, you know, these returns um, consistently for, you know, you know, let's say six of the years that it's that it's been evaluated, six of the eight years it's been evaluated over there are really quite strong, even if it is on a levered basis. And the distribution of the monthly returns, you know, has a positive mean and a positive skew. So this all looks really good. Um, and then, uh, you know, drill, drill deeper still, let's look at that um, net exposure. And you can sort of see here, this looks so lovely. Um, this is the profile where, you know, someone um, understands uh, what their dollar exposure is. And, you know, with the exception of maybe some blips in terms of data, I'm guessing back at the very beginning, you can see how tightly managed the net exposure is to being $0 exposed on a net basis um, and allocating sort of 50% of the weight to the long book and the short book. So that looks really nice and well constructed. Um, and then same thing for the max and median position concentration on the long and the short side. You can see that there's sort of an, a, a really nicely um, managed exposure. And even the daily turnover, um, you know, this is definitely on the high-ish end, but is still, um, you know, well within the bounds of something that we'd be interested in. So this plot is showing you um, in light blue uh, the daily turnover and then an average um, turnover across like net and, and across um, on a monthly basis. So this all looks good. So where does this um, strategy run into trouble? Um, so this strategy runs into trouble when you run a PNL attribution analysis um, and you look at, um, okay, from what set of its invested assets is it making its profit? And so on the good news for us, it's not trading any ETFs, whether they're allowed or not allowed. Not to say ETFs are inherently bad, but now we know it's just trading stocks. So we have sort of a handle on what it's doing and it's not, you know, mixing stocks with ETFs in a way we then have to go back and understand. But the problem is um, that it's deriving a substantial fraction of its P&L from names that are 
outside of this um, Quantopian 1500 tradable universe. Um, so um, that's currently the universe that we're constrained to trading um, in our institutional um, platform um, for a lot of reasons that you know, I, I won't necessarily dive into here. And so when we find this and found this in the diligence process, we said, okay, well, yeah, that's a bummer. About half the returns come from uh, stocks that we probably can't trade. So um, could you go ahead and just do a revision and limit the tradable universe to the stocks um, you know, that are in our universe? And so the author kindly agreed to do that. Um, and then, you know, recap just to remind you what we had seen in terms of the in and out of sample sharp ratio and the equity curve and how that looks. And now um, here's how the strategy looks uh, over the same time period, you know, controlling and keeping everything else the same, except for the um, adjustment of limiting to those liquid top 1500 tradable names. And so now you can see, um, you know, yes, you've still got performance left. It's still a positive sharp ratio, but now your six months of out of sample, you know, has fallen, you know, well below that threshold of wanting to see, you know, a one sharp out of sample. Um, and even if you sort of look across the entirety of the time range, you're falling below a sharp of one. Um, this is, I think, you know, maybe almost as common uh, a problem as the overfitting and data mining problem is. Um, and really that's because, you know, quant strategies or a lot of the types of strategies that, you know, we're interested in and think can work when they're implemented properly, they rely a lot on sorting, right? And so when you're sorting, um, you can pick up on apparent inefficiencies and these, you know, outlier values uh, that end up in the tails of these distributions that, are you know again apparent inefficiencies because they exist in stocks that are really not uh, tradable at any scale due to um, due to liquidity typically. Um, so to try to help folks with that, um, we created a universe definition for this sort of liquid tradable fifteen hundred, and I think we're working on a revision to this where we don't explicitly cap it at fifteen hundred names, um, and we include a couple of you know, some other liquid tradable ETFs. But I think currently this is sort of your, your most useful tool in just removing these illiquid securities from your universe at the very beginning of your research process so that you're not spending your time um, sort of getting fooled by um, signal that appears to be there, but it turns out to be in instruments that really, you know, aren't that accessible to trade, you know, or aren't accessible to trade at scale. Um, all right. So what have we learned here? We've, you know, kind of gone along a little bit of a trail of tears in that all these four strategies, which look, you know, really compelling by some measures, um, sort of don't, uh, don't make the, don't make the grade. So what have we learned? Um, I think both for, um, folks working on algorithms and for Quantopian, algorithms that don't make the grade can still be extremely valuable to the extent that we understand um, you know, why and we understand what these failure modes are that we're discovering um, in our selection process. There is a lot of ground for us to be able to feed this information back into product and educational content development. Um, so that's a great segue into, you know, if you're not already an avid um, consumer of the educational materials, the lecture series um, that's that's been developed, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you go take a look at it. Um, and specifically, there are lectures that I've just kind of pulled out here to highlight that address each of the problems that I highlighted um, in terms of where these algorithms sort of fell short. And um, it's funny because I put together this presentation sort of talking about um, these kind of common failure modes. And then uh, Delaney, um, who uh, is the guy that runs this sort of academic effort and has um, built a lot of these lectures along with Max on his team, I sat down with him and said, okay, you know, these are the examples that I'm going to show. These are the problems. And he's like, oh, yeah, I have lectures for all of those. Um, and so we sort of like compared notes and we're like, oh, yeah, this is great. You know, you, you really have already captured in lecture form um, all of these different problems. So these would be a great example of sort of four different lectures, hopefully they're still numbered this way, that you could go take a look at um, to drill more into these issues that I'm talking about. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention is that all of the software underpinning all of this analysis, including, um, you know, I saw Phoebe saying that 
uh, there are folks asking how we're computing different performance metrics. The software is all open source, so I can talk a little bit about it. But the nice thing is that you can also go take a look yourself at how we're co computing Sharp. Um, so Zipline, AlphaLens, and PyFolio, those are sort of the three um, key libraries that I use a lot. Um, Zipline is, of course, the, the backtesting library that's being used um, sort of, you know, both by users to run their back tests, but also then um, by us to sort of run this um, bulk uh, evaluation of algorithms. Um, AlphaLens is, I didn't show any results uh, from AlphaLens, but I have a separate talk on that actually that, that you could probably look up. So AlphaLens is an amazing tool where you can sort of take a single predictive factor um, that you've built um, or think you've built and look and just without sort of going through the work of figuring out how you'd want to trade it, you just look whether this single factor sort of has predictive power on future returns. Um, so that's a really nice library. And then finally, um, all of the results that I showed you today are um, analyses that I pulled from a PyFolio tear sheet. Um, PyFolio is where we're putting all of the most recent work that we've been doing. I didn't include um, and have a chance to update the slides today, but I talked with Phoebe about um, that I want to uh, basically be able to update this talk and share with you guys some more of the results of the um, factor risk analysis um, where we're really getting all of the common risk exposures um, in uh, sort of a, a you know, um, an instantaneous fashion by looking at um, using our risk model output. And then also we have um, a more advanced um, performance attribution. So I'm going to try to um, add that um, and update this presentation in the future with that. All right, so now I'm going to take questions. Phoebe's feeding some to me, and I'm also going to open up uh, this box so that I can sort of try to see. Um, okay, how many... Um, how many Quantopian algo, how many Quantopian portfolios? Oh, okay, great. I understand. So the question is um, of the algos that we're selecting, I think the question is how many investment products are we offering? So um, currently we've launched one investment product and it's a pure alpha vehicle. So um, all the strategies that we have selected for allocations are going into one portfolio construction right now, it's matching one investment mandate. Um, and that's the product that that we're offering. So um, there's there's basically a single product um, so far. Um, um, you will be able to get a copy of the presentation. We're recording um, the talk as well, so we'll share that with you. Um, let's see. Someone's asking. Is it necessary to keep the algos beta consistently between plus and minus 0.3, or is it sufficient for it to be close to beta neutral on a longer term basis? So um, that's a really good question. Um, and I see this a lot. I think there's perfectly good reasons where um, you can have sort of an inconsistent beta exposure. And you might have some factor in your model that's sort of effectively telling your strategy to time beta. Um, philosophically, that's fine, but it's not acceptable in terms of sort of our investment mandate. And the reason for that is, again, like I mentioned, that when you're sort of adding up the risk across all of these portfolios and then requiring them to sort of all fit under um, a portfolio level global risk umbrella, if your strategy has, you know, a beta of 0.5 for three to six to 12 months, um, that's going to consume, you know, far too much of the sort of very, very tight beta exposure of the overall portfolio. Um, and so a strategy like that, you know, I don't think would would make it past the evaluation process. But then another thing to, to consider, and I didn't sort of talk about this, it's not kind of within the scope of this of this presentation, but the way that we then, let's say the algorithm um, sort of is right at the border of a beta that we might allow. And then we put the algorithm in the portfolio. Um, the way that we determine the size of the allocations is basically ba based on um, an equal risk budgeting in an optimization that we run. So the lowest fall strategies over a trailing historical period get the largest allocation. And on top of that, we have a layer that considers estimated capacity of the strategy and also an adjustment that we do if risk exposures or let's say beta exposure is too large. Um, so if you do get a strategy all the way through and it gets an allocation, 
um, the way to get the largest allocation is to really have the most tightly risk controlled, most pure alpha, lowest historical vol. Um, that strategy is going to get the biggest allocation. So it's sort of where, where you'd want to focus. Um, pure alpha is a, absolute return is a question that I got. Um, you know, yeah, I think, you know, alpha is obviously like a term that gets thrown around a lot and is um, can be used in a lot of different contexts in this industry. The nice thing about the work that we have done on developing our own risk model internally, um, that again, we're going to sort of try to be pushing out over the course of the next few months, is that now we can sort of start to have a conversation with the community where what we're going to mean by alpha is this very explicit thing of like, the unattributed returns from your algorithm after running it through a risk model that tries to match up its returns to a bunch of common risk factors. Um, the risk factors that we're looking at right now are 11 um, sectors and then five style factors. Um, so, you know, we'll be able to share more details on that and then we can have like, I think a kind of more tangible conversation about it. Um, so what's the average ratio of out of sample to in sample sharp ratio you've experienced for algos you've allocated to, um, and do you publish, um, our fund performance? So don't think we publish our fund performance. We launched in June. Um, and that would be sort of like an investor relations question. There's a lot of SEC rules around, um, you know, not marketing performance. So we have to be really careful around that. Um, in terms of sort of what we've observed, um, I think, back of the envelope, like you definitely continue to see, um, you know, variance in the in-sample sharp ratio. Um, you know, rules of thumb that, I don't know if we have enough data that sort of matches up to this, but two different rules of thumb that um, I've either sort of come across in the past or, or had other industry practitioners sort of give me are, on the one hand, folks will sort of say, oh, you know, I'm going to look at the in-sample sharp ratio and assume it's going to get cut in half out of sample. Um, another sort of even, I guess, more pessimistic uh, view I had heard was, I'm going to look at the in-sample sharp ratio and subtract two. And I think that's going to be the out-of-sample sharp ratio. Um, in one sense, those are almost both optimistic and saying that there's not something um, almost like adverse selection bias wise about the in-sample sharp ratio. So um, one thing that we've been thinking about a lot is, again, trying to um, really mitigate concerns about overfitting. And we feel like once we've run strategies through our risk model and looked at the returns that are not attributable to common risk factors, um, we think those are going to be perhaps more predictive and more persistent um, than, than just sort of the overall observed sharp ratio. So we're doing some work internally right now to try to see if there um, is like a higher autocorrelation or predictive um, result looking at alpha returns, let's say, or residual returns, as opposed to just the in-sample um, or not a sample sharp ratio. Um, okay, another great question is, do we accept or consider algos that use data outside of our data store that, that might use Fetcher? Um, so we have not thus far, but we are open to this, actually. Um, there's more legwork for us to do um, if you have a data source that's not within our store. So um, one thing I would say is that I'm not sure that our automated evaluation process will be sure to catch your algo um, because if we overwrite your start date and end date, for example, and now we're asking your algo to run over a period that you didn't have fetcher data for, or um, you know, you your data source is maybe no longer available. So one concern would be, are we catching your algo through our automated selection process? If we might not be, you're certainly welcome to shoot us a specific email saying, hey, I have a strategy I think you guys would be interested in. It meets all of your you know, investment uh, requirements, uses this outside data set. So, and then here's, you know, a, my portfolio tear sheet would, would be extremely happy to look at it. Um, the concerns we have to figure out when we have um, some external data source are basically, you know, we have then sort of two layers of diligence that we need to do, one on the strategy itself and then one on the delivery of that data source. Uh, but, but in theory, um, we're interested in it. Um, are there compliance issues for folks that are FINRA or SEC licensed? Um, I don't know. I'd have to dig in on that. So the way that our license agreement works is that Quantopian is the fiduciary. We're licensing 
Um, it's basically an IP royalty agreement. So we're licensing, you know, intellectual property um, or technology is how it's defined in the agreement. So there's no fiduciary responsibility conferred onto the algo author. Um, that said, we are extremely cognizant and want to be really sensitive to not putting anyone in like a situation where they could be perceived to be in conflict with their day job. So typically what we do is if we find an author um, who works, you know, in the industry, um, we would, you know, typically sort of ask them, uh, you know, what their um, situation is in terms of, you know, they have to basically represent that this IP they're licensing us is, you know, is theirs to license and is not in conflict with any other employment agreements. Um, and in some cases, we've asked folks just, you know, for the for their own peace of mind and ours, um, for a, a letter from their day jobs compliance department or or from, you know, someone there saying, you know, hey, you know, it's okay with us. Uh, Bob has written this algorithm in his in his free time and has nothing to do with his day job. And we're cognizant of that and we're okay with it. Um, okay, I think I talked a little bit about this. The question is, how do you choose the capital allocation for each algo? Um, I think I talked a little bit about it, but um, it's really interesting. So I will we'll just quickly recap that again. Um, we run a monthly rebalance process where the capital allocations across the set of selected algos um, can be changed. We have a, a pretty sort of smooth updating function because um, we put in a little bit of a turnover constraint. Um, we think it makes sense for the weights to sort of move smoothly. Um, but that's really an automated process as well. So we run a portfolio optimization, um, which is you know, principally based around equal risk budgeting to each algo. So if you imagined giving our portfolio construction um, 10, you know, algos that all had like identical characteristics to them, they would, you know, probably get equal allocations. Um, but if you give it 10 algos that have uh, widely varying historical volatility, you will allocate more capital to the low vol strategies and less to the high vol strategies. And then the two other um, pieces we layer in are capacity awareness um, and some awareness of the maximum sort of beta or risk exposures where we lower the caps a little bit on that. Um, how many algorithms are contained in the pure alpha portfolio? I think today there are 14 algos that are trading. Um, what data source do you use? Not sure um, specifically what that's referencing. So we have minutely market uh, data, pricing, and volume data on the platform. The live data, I believe, comes from Nanex. We have fundamental data from Morningstar. Um, and then you can take a look at quantobian.com slash data. That will show you the list of data sets that we've integrated that are um, available for you. And I should say that um, one really nice thing about the way that um, we work with data on the platform is um, because it's sort of a, a sandbox where your source code lives on the server with the data sets, um, then we don't need to have redistribution deals with data vendors. So we can offer free sample data on the platform and we do on every single data set that's available. Um, and then if you want access to live data, you can go ahead and pay for it. Um, but we don't require that you're paying for any data source that you've um, tested in order to evaluate it. So our arrangement with data vendors is that we can evaluate strategies and sort of use the full data set available to us. So you, you should be able to uh, take a look at and get access to enough sample data of, for any data source that we've integrated to be able to do some interesting work with it. And then we're able to evaluate that for you. Um, Um, someone asks, why are we using Sharp and not Sortino? We don't just sort on Sharp. We have Sortino in there too. So we're definitely um, not doing like a single, um, a single factor analysis here. We look at, we do look at the Sortino ratio as well. And like I said, um, we're actually like doing a lot of work right now thinking about, you know, what is the most predictive and valuable measure to us. Um, and there's definitely some results we have um, and I think one paper that we had put out maybe even as much as a year or more ago where um, we actually saw tail ratio being um, one of the more strongly predictive in sample features. Um, I have some ideas on a strategy. Um, can I have someone help me implement it? 
Um, that's a great question, especially because I get that a lot, especially when I go um, speak at events in person. And there are folks who know uh, more about the finance or investing side um, and less about the um, implementation side. So we don't have sort of a staff of folks that are out there um, writing code with users. However, I would definitely encourage you to use our community um, so the um, quantopian.com, I think, slash forums, our, our public community, there's a lot of um, great um, networking that gets done there and collaboration and folks who know, you know, one side of the sort of fintech business more than the other. So definitely encourage you um, to look for, you know, sort of a partner um, to help to help you with coding. Um, if a strategy is accepted, can we invest in the whole portfolio? That's a great question. Um, because of the way the investment vehicle, um, you know, the type of investment vehicle that it is, it's, um, it is open to investment only by qualified purchasers. Um, so you, you cannot necessarily, um, if your algo is accepted, it doesn't mean that you necessarily um, can be a fund investor um, at this point. That's a great question, though. Um, let's see. How many free parameters do you allow in an algorithm? That is a really good question. We don't have, like the API isn't broken out where we sort of like explicitly see how many free parameters you have. So we don't, um, we don't have an easy way of like enforcing or controlling that. Um, that said, you know, our philosophical, I guess, input would be, you know, that always fewer free parameters is better and dealing with limited and noisy data. Um, but that's not like something that we currently sort of specifically evaluate on. That's probably something that, you know, we look at your algorithm um, and the data exhausts with you. And we're trying to understand, um, you know, something about how perfectly it fits data in sample and, and whether or not it's matching up out of sample. You know, that's something that might come up in the conversation and we might ask you about. Um, Any idea when crypto data will be available for algos? Um, there are like a lot of strong opinions internally at Quantopian about cryptocurrency and crypto data. Um, I we're not currently working on um, on it, so uh, I won't give an idea of when. But it's definitely something, obviously, in the in the area that's that's really interesting. I guess for our standpoint, we're trying to be really focused on. Um, you know, the alpha vehicle, and that's an institutional investment vehicle. Um, and so I do think like it's a little tricky right now to see um, kind of how we fit crypto um, investing in with sort of that um, core mandate, but it's a really interesting area. Um, let's see, what are some of the best trading strategies used in HFT firms? You would have to ask an HFT firm. Um, I would have some guesses, but I won't try to opine on that. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many questions. Okay, let's see. What time is it? Okay, Phoebe's feeding me some questions that she thinks are good for, let me skip to, she's read through these and picked some. Um, Is there a document that describes the investment guidelines that would help authors craft compliant algos? So there is a page, I think it's quantopian.com slash allocation. Maybe Phoebe, you can check for me if that's the right link. Um, so there is a page where we try to describe um, these criteria at a high level um, with what we look for and what we don't look for. I think it's slash allocation, um, but we'll take a look and I'll see if I can confirm that. Another good question is, um, how do we think about removing algos from the investment vehicle? Um, okay, Phoebe tells me that's correct. Quantopian.com slash allocation or allocations. I don't know. One of those two. Allocation, A-L-L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N. So that has sort of the best guidelines that we've, um, you know, sort of put up on the site. And um, it's something that I expect we'll update. Like I said, I'm sort of leading you guys by saying, hey, now we have built this risk model and we're starting to use it more. So um, we're going to be working on, on rolling that out and communicating, communicating those results to you guys as well. So great question on how we think about removing algos. Um, the way that we think about that uh, philosophically is that um, we had 
you know, presumably had a good reason to put an algo in the portfolio. So that's sort of like decision one. Um, then we have a portfolio construction process that's going to, on an ongoing basis, continue to decide, you know, how much weight that algo should have in the portfolio. And when you would look to remove that algo from the portfolio, you'd really want to do that when um, you sort of think that um, you have accumulated enough information that tells you that you know, at scale and in this trading environment and in this portfolio, you're not seeing results that are consistent with what you would have been led to expect from the back test or even from the out of sample simulated data. So there we're looking at things like the evolution of the live returns within that sort of cone of expectation that I was showing you. Um, we're looking at things like, let's say an algorithm is deployed and it has a drawdown um, we're looking to see, okay, if the algo is in a drawdown, um, what size, um, like sort of what breadth and depth of drawdown is it in with respect to the drawdowns that we observed in simulation? So if you sort of, you know, are unhappy that, okay, you launch an algo and, you know, n weeks or months later, it's experiencing a, you know, 3% drawdown that's 30 days long, but you go look in the simulation that you ran and that's, you know, that drawdown is, you know, sort of the 10th most severe drawdown from the simulation. It's hard to sort of justify and say, oh, well, I really should remove that strategy. So we're really trying um, to sort of, I guess, like, look to see if um, we're seeing results that are in line with simulation. And then separately, we're looking at our transaction cost analysis. So we sort of know... Um, what level of transaction costs we've modeled in the simulation um, coming in. And then that's something that we can also look at. Um, and our trading team is, is sort of does a lot of analysis around that is saying, okay, now what are, the what are the trading costs that are being realized for this strategy? So that would be another reason that you might take a strategy out um, would be if you say, hey, you know, on a perfect sort of frictionless basis, the simulation kind of continues to look good through today. But in trading, we're not able to realize that, for for example. Um, and I would say we haven't seen that much of that. We've been pretty happy with um, the costs that we're realizing in the trading and execution side of things. And so it's it's more sort of, you know, hey, you know, when you're accumulating out of sample data, you know, six months is is not that long. And now the fund vehicle's been launched just since June, so it's just not a ton of data to be able to form a lot of confidence in saying, you know, this this does or doesn't match expectations yet. I think that's the part that really um, requires patience and time. Um, all right. So what about algorithms that trade futures or a combination of futures and equities? That's a great question. Um, we are really excited that uh, the capability to backtest with futures, I think there's like 72 listed contracts um, that you can um, back test with. So we're, we're really excited to finally have that capability shipped. Um, and that's something that we are very interested in looking at putting into our pure alpha vehicle. So we do want to look at strategies um, that trade futures and also possibly combinations of futures plus equities. We're not actively mining those um, and evaluating those yet. And that's mainly because there hasn't been sort of enough time range for folks to build strategies that are six months old already. Um, and we are, have worked a bit on upgrading our analysis tools, um, adding measures like uh, conditional value at risk to be able to sort of do an apples to apples comparison um, of future strategies. So I would say on the algo selection side, that's a little bit of a work in progress. Um, the things that we'll be looking for really are similar to what I discussed with equities. Obviously, it's a little bit different in terms of the way that you think about um, what your risk exposures are. But if you shift into that framework, we're still looking for, um, you know, systematic alpha. Um, so, you know, not probably as much looking for like CTA style trend following, um, but maybe more looking for, you know, things where um, you know, there's sort of a view in, you know, this equity or this future should is, is worth more than that future. And there's some, you know, dynamic and independent betting that's updating through time um, that we can follow. Um, okay, so then we've got, um, and I'll, I'll maybe do, Phoebe, like two more questions, I'm thinking. Um, um, so the next question is, what is the general payout like for algos that gets picked? And are there any minimum payment guarantees? And how is payment made through what channel? That's a great question. Um, so the structure of the agreement 
is a percent of P&L. Typically, it's 10%. And that's on the gross market value that's invested. Um, and it's accrued on a daily basis, but it's paid out annually. Um, and how it's paid out, right now, it's being paid out annually. So I think we like literally sending people checks. Um, of course, we're all tech nerds. So we all think it would be awesome to like pay people um, with smart contracts or Bitcoin or something like this. Um, but really right now we're just trying to focus on getting people paid, um, you know, getting people paid in any form possible. Um, and there are not minimum payment guarantees right now. Um, what we do, the way we think about that right now during our ramp up phase is that we are asking authors for exclusive use of their algorithm in our investment vehicle for some time period. Um, and typically that is three years. But obviously, if you feel like your strategy is really good um, and is going to make money, then you would you know, want sort of some minimum from us. The way that we deal with that is um, because we really need to allocate the capital in the portfolio in line with sort of our fiduciary duty to investors, we can't make um, commitments where we don't know what the performance of individual algorithms are going to be, if that makes sense. So if we were, you know, kind of doing proprietary trading or a different business model, that would, would look different maybe. So since we can't do that, the way that we think about it is, you, know, you have an opportunity cost allowing us to have exclusive access to your IP for some term. And so what we do is we say, um, and this is something that we um, have some standards for, but we kind of are willing to, to talk with folks about. We say, okay, after one year, if your allocation hasn't reached level XYZ, where X is something like maybe you know 5 million um, in GMV, then you'll have the option to say, I don't want to continue um, this license agreement. So that's kind of the way that we've tried to approach guaranteed minimums is to more work with folks and say, okay, you know, what's the capacity of this strategy? How much um, do we think we're going to be able to allocate to it? And, you know, let's put in some tiers where if we are able to reach those milestones, we get to continue um, the right to trade that algorithm. So that's the way that we've thought about that. Um, okay, so the last one is I will, will, um, well, these are these are two that are short, I think, and quick. So, would it be acceptable to hedge the Q fifteen hundred U.S. equities using futures and vice versa? So, yes, I think uh, if I didn't make that clear, we're willing um, to look at strategies that have a combination of futures and equities. Um, so, yes, that would be. And then, can I explain premium versus free data sets? That looks like it's a question that came in. Okay, so so. Um, yeah, the way that we think about the premium versus free is, you know, um, in terms of our data store, that's really a marketplace where we're trying to um, bring together data vendors who, you know, often traditionally, and this is, you know, sort of where I come from in a past life, I worked for Thomson Reuters before I came to Quantopian. Um, so a lot of these data vendors have, typically are used to selling data into institutions or asset managers and not to individuals. Um, that said, there are a lot of sort of newer and boutique data providers that are interested um, and typically have sold to individuals. So the, what we've tried to do um, with the data marketplace is basically create a spot where we can bring together a potentially attractive opportunity for data vendors that, you know, um, gets them to want to provide some free sample data and then for folks that want to write algorithms. Um, and the, you know, the sort of market that we've struck initially is to say, okay, um, if you want access to the most recent data or, you know, live data, then there'll be some fee for that. Um, and if you just want to use a historical free sample to develop your strategy, you're going to have access to do that for free. Um, so that's sort of, I think, typically the way it's set up. Now, we have some data vendors on the platform who have sort of really bought into the idea that um, the marketing value and sort of the proof of concept, the ease, ease of proving out how good their data is to folks on the platform is so valuable that they have just actually made their data free across the board, including live. And their play is that they just want you know people to to realize and see how good their data is and they think they'll generate some amount of leads um, where folks will be um, 
sort of need access to the data set off of the Quantopian platform, perhaps, or, you know, we'll sort of generate leads that they'll then um, directly be able to talk with those folks and, and sell the data to them directly. Um, specifically with respect to like what I'm talking about in this webinar today for evaluating strategies, I want to make sure that it's clear that if you do have an idea that um, of how to sort of use a, a premium data set, um, you can develop your algo using the free sample data and we will still be able to evaluate it. So um, when we run our um, sort of batch, um, we call it the test harness, our, our internal kind of batch back testing process, um, we have the ability to set that to sort of override the, um, the database access control system um, that's used in the store. So we can still evaluate your algorithm. So hopefully that answers, um, answers that question. So thanks so much for your time and your fantastic questions. If I didn't get to a question um, that you have, here's my email right here. Feel free to shoot me a note um, and ask me a question and I would be happy to talk with you offline. Thanks so much.